Well, this morning we return to the book of 1 Peter. Uh, if you're new here, we're going consecutively through the book of 1 Peter, and we come to chapter 2, verses 11 and 12 uh, this morning. Uh, one of the things when we are going consecutively through a book of the Bible, uh, the Bible chooses the subject, not me. And so we want to declare the whole counsel of God as it's contained in this book, uh, the Bible. Now, let me briefly recap where we are in our study. Peter has described our magnificent salvation in our Lord Jesus Christ. He's also emphasized the identity we have as the people of God. He's told us we're a chosen race. We're a holy priesthood, a royal priesthood. We are those who have received the mercy of God. And in response to this magnificent salvation, uh, Peter is challenging us to live holy lives, to live obedient lives, to live lives of, of love, and to live lives where we desire the sincere milk of the Word. He's told us that we have been called, called out of darkness into His marvelous light. And all of this is wonderful, and we rejoice at the salvation we have in our Lord Jesus Christ. But, as we'll see this morning, as followers of Jesus Christ, we soon realize that there is real opposition. We have an insidious enemy who tries to destroy us. So let's read that in 1 Peter. I trust you have come with your Bible. 1 Peter chapter 2, uh, verses 11 and 12. We also have Bibles in the pew in front of you. Two short verses we're looking at. Beloved, I urge you, as sojourners and exiles, to abstain from the passions of the flesh which wage war against your soul. Keep your conduct among the Gentiles honorable, so that when they speak against you as evildoers, they may see your good deeds and glorify God on the day of visitation. This is the Word of God to us today. In the Bible, we understand that the Christian has three enemies. First, there is the devil. Peter describes him later as your adversary. We have an adversary, and he is the devil. Secondly, we have the world. That means the sinful world around us, the world which is so alluring, but James the Apostle reminds us it is at enmity against God. Two enemies our adversary, the world, and now the enemy we're thinking about today, the flesh. Our sinful nature, which as we've read, is waging war against us. And in some ways, I think uh, our flesh is the most deceptive of our enemies because we enjoy the flesh when it presents itself as a friend. But although it appears as a friend, your flesh, your sinful desires are at enemy against you. Our flesh, we could say, is a traitor within us with a multitude of disguises, all plotting your destruction. And so Peter here is giving an urgent exhortation to these first century readers, and so to us. He is urging them, he's saying. He's appealing to them, reminding them that they are at war against an insidious, deadly enemy. The world and the flesh, the world and the devil, rather, are external enemies. The flesh, our sinful nature, is an internal enemy. It's an assassin, as it were. It's a, a traitor, a mole within us, waging war, says Peter, against your soul. This is very strong language, isn't it? And we must understand it as we seek to follow our Lord Jesus Christ. So as we come to 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 11, Peter is now dealing with our relationships, and in the passage that follows, he's dealing with our relationships not within the Christian community, but with the outside pagan world. We're going to see that as we continue our study. But first, he gives us this warning to understand that as we serve God in our culture, we must have an understanding of our internal enemy. First, he gives a negative command in verse 11, 
and then a positive command in verse 12. First, the negative command in verse 11. What is it? Abstain from the passions of the flesh. Peter is writing to believers. Look at the text. It's described as the passions of the flesh. That is our sinful nature, our sinful desires. The Greek word is epithumia, often translated lusts or desires. In this case, passions of the flesh. They will wreck your spiritual life. Now, when we talk about the flesh here, we're not talking about our body, our human flesh, which is God given us. No, He is using flesh in an ethical and a moral sense of that which is apart from God. That is when we act in an independent way. Our flesh, these sinful desires, these lusts, are always, always our enemy. And until our glorification, we will always have these passions of the flesh. Jesus says in John 3, that which is of the flesh is flesh. And these passions of the flesh, did you notice, they are waging war against your soul. Peter is urging his readers, he's appealing to them, and as he does so, he uses a military term, waging war, present tense. No, these passions of the flesh which attack us, they are not a skirmish. This is not an occasional battle. It is a war. Your passions of the flesh are constantly waging war against you trying to destroy your soul. Abstain from the passions of the flesh which wage war against your soul. They're not just a problem. They're not just a slight distraction. They are your enemy, and we must understand it. They are constantly waging war against us, so we must constantly be on alert. alert. We must be strong. We must be courageous, as we heard from one of the verses from one of the candidates of baptism. These passions, these sinful desires attack unexpectedly and often without warning and with disastrous consequences. Remember 9-11? Our enemy hating the United States. Our enemy struck ruthlessly, without warning, unexpectedly, with the most deadly of consequences. That's the point. The passions of your flesh are waging war against you. What's your response? Abstain. Don't you admire the brevity of the Word of God? Here it is. Abstain. You know what that means. Stop doing it. When you're lured into evil by your lusts, you will lose the sense of God's power and presence. You will be spiritually defiled. You will quench the Holy Spirit, finding yourself spiritually dirty, finding you lack the assurance of the presence of God as you go through life. This may well be the reason. Passions of the flesh have attacked you, and you have succumbed. This is a deadly destructive and dangerous enemy. Moderation is not, the, is not the command. The command is clear. Abstain. Abstinence. Now, these fleshly lusts and passions clearly include sexual sins. And today, people think if they feel a certain way, if they've convinced themselves they're in love with someone, they can pursue these lusts. Scripture says, however you feel, understand this. You have an enemy, and you are to abstain. You are to have a zero-tolerance policy. Today, the discussion on sexual activity sometimes becomes a discussion on safety. Safe sex, apparently, is the goal. But when dealing with sexuality, the Bible is concerned not so much with safety, but with sanctity, with the holiness. Sexual activity is not primarily a medical issue, it's a moral issue, it's a spiritual issue. The only safe sex is sexual intimacy within the confines of marriage. You find yourself 
in a sexual relationship outside of marriage, whether you're single or married? What's the Scripture saying to you? Stop it. Stop it. Abstain. Stop it. No. Don't do it. It's wrong. Stop it. And these passions of the flesh, these lusts of the flesh, are not to be fed. This is part of our problem, isn't it? We are surrounded by images, sexual images, pornography, salacious social media do not promote abstinence. They do not bring you closer to the Lord Jesus Christ. What do they do? They inflame and feed the passions of the flesh, which will damage your soul, which will weaken your spiritual life, which will distort your thinking, which will place you in spiritual bondage, will pervert your view of intimacy, will mess up your sexuality, will wreck your marriage and relationships. So listen to the voice of God. <clears throat> choir sang to us a magnificent song and reminded us of the greatness of God. God is great. We heard that at the beginning of the service, and greatly to be praised. This great God is all wise. He created you, and He knows far better than you how you should live. Here is the voice of God. Contrary to all the voices of our society, abstain. Now, these passions of the flesh certainly include sexual sins, but there's other passions of the flesh. Turn to the book of Galatians if you have your Bible. Galatians. Paul's letter to the Galatians, chapter 5. You may be a little smug today, say, well, I'm not involved in sexual activity, but what about your mind? But there's more. Galatians 5, verse 19. You say, what are these passions of the flesh? Here they are. Here are some of them. Now the works of the flesh are evident. Notice what he says first. Sexual immorality, impurity, sensuality. Are you listening? Idolatry, sorcery, enmity, strife, jealousy, fits of anger, rivalries, dissensions, divisions, envy, drunkenness, orgies, and things like these. I warn you, says Paul, as I warned you before, that those who do such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. And then he goes on to describe, in contrast to the works of the flesh, the fruit of the Spirit. As I read these works of the flesh, you guilty of any of them? These lusts for power, for money, popularity, pleasures. Do you have fits of anger? A lot of angry men out there. That's the passion of the flesh. You've lost control of yourself. You shout. You abuse others. You're a troublemaker. Wherever you go, there's a fight. There's divisions. You're always arguing against everyone. That's the work of the flesh. These fleshly, greedy passions, they're very powerful forces in our lives, and none of us can say we're exempt from them. But followers of Christ have a higher power. You say, these are strong powers, the flesh. Yes, they are. But in Galatians 5, Paul says, verse 16, I say, walk by the Spirit, as the Holy Spirit, and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh, the passions of the flesh. It's the same word, epithumia, the desires, the lusts of the flesh. If you walk by the Spirit, you're indwelled by the Spirit. Allow the Spirit to control you. And as you do that, you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. We have the Holy Spirit enables us to obey God, to live a life which please God so that we can resist and defeat these fleshly passions. You say, John, well, <clears throat> I find this pretty tough. How do we do this? It's interesting that Peter does not directly tell us how we are to abstain from the passions of the flesh. Paul has told us in Galatians 5. But as we follow Peter's arguments, I think he gives us a clue, a motivation, two motivations, so that we can abstain from the lusts of the flesh. 
Notice how he addresses his readers in dealing with this very tough subject. He addresses them as beloved. That's wonderful, isn't it? He's going to talk about this nasty subject of the passions of the flesh, but he reminds his readers that they are beloved. It's the, it's the word agape, which is love. They are beloved. And an understanding, I want you to think with me on this, an understanding of the love of God is a great motivation to abstain from the passions of the flesh. Peter is reminding us as followers of Jesus Christ that we're greatly loved. Above all, we're loved by God, that God so loved the world that He gave His only Son, that God commends His love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. This God is a God of love, a God who loves me. His love has flooded my heart. God continues to love me. Every day, every moment, He is loving me, and this is divine love. And this is the very opposite of the lusts, the passions of the flesh. Think also of how you're loved by others, beloved, true love. As followers of Jesus Christ, you have experienced the pure love of God, that sacrificial love whereby you have been redeemed. Think of that. What do the passions of the flesh do? What does lust do? Lust demands. Lust takes. Lust uses. Love manipulates. It's self-centered. It's never satisfied. It's always demanding, insistent, impatient, and selfish. That's the passions of the flesh. Never satisfied. Always demanding. Going back to it over and over and over again. I deserve to be happy. It's time to take care of myself, we hear. And that seems to be an excuse for living contrary to the will of God. True love is the opposite of lust. Love gives. God so loved the world that He gave His only Son. If you're in a relationship, think, is it a relationship of lust, of the passions of the flesh, or is it a relationship of love? Love gives. Love is patient. Love is undemanding. Love is sacrificial. It's pure. It's honorable. Lust, these passions of the flesh, they promise so much but deliver so little in contrary to the love of God. The more you bathe in the love of God, the greater you understand the love of God, the more you'll be drawn to your Savior because this Savior loved me and gave Himself for me. And we are people of sincere love. <clears throat> Peter has told us that. In chapter 1, verse 22, he says, having purified your souls by obedience to the truth for a sincere brotherly love, love one another. One of our themes this year, love one another. Think of the, the power of love. You're loved by your husband. You're loved by your wife. You're loved by your children. You love your children. You love your grandchildren. You love your grandparents. You love your friends. Here at Calvary, we love our brothers and sisters in Christ. We truly are beloved. Think of that. So when you're tempted with a passion of the flesh, reflect on God's love for you. Reflect on the love that is given to you by your family and your friends. Don't lust. But as we heard from one of the baptismal candidates, we are called to love the Lord our God with all our heart, with all our soul, with all of our, our mind. And so, when you're tempted by these fleshly lusts, meditate on Calvary's love. Meditate on the Lamb of God who loved you and gave Himself for you. And an understanding, I think, of the love of God is a great motivation to abstain from these fleshly lusts, these passions of the flesh. But there's another motivation. Note also how he addresses them. Chapter 2, verse 11, Beloved, I urge you, I'm appealing to you as sojourners and exiles. 
Isn't that interesting? In dealing with the passions of the flesh, he's appealing to them as sojourners and exiles. Yes, an understanding of the world to come is a motivation to abstain from these passions of the flesh. An understanding that I am a pilgrim, I'm a sojourner, I'm an exile, helps me to resist these passions of the flesh. He's begun his epistle in chapter 1, verse 1, referring to his readers as elect exiles. Now they are sojourners and exiles. They're strangers in the world. They're pilgrims in the world. We are people living in a foreign country, is the point. And a proper relationship with the world begins with the understanding that we as followers of Christ do not belong to this world. This world is not our home. Our alien world out there, the culture out there, you know, has different values, has different standards, have different desires, advocate a way of life which is very different from those of us who are following the Lord Jesus. So we are bombarded by the media, by the culture, telling us to live a certain way, <clears throat> telling us that certain behavior is acceptable, and Peter is reminding them, no, you're a sojourner, you're in exile, therefore abstain from the fleshly lust which we'd war against your soul. These passions of the flesh are totally inconsistent with those who are bound for heaven. Why are you living that way when you're a sojourner? Why are you succumbing to these passions of the flesh which are destroying you, which will destroy the relationships around you when you are bound for heaven? We are to be characterized not by the values of the world, but by, but by the values of the world which is to come. Today I say to you, don't keep looking within. Don't focus on these passions of the flesh. Don't look out to the world. Look up. Look up to Christ. Get your eyes on Christ. Get your eyes on the man of Calvary. Keep looking up. A couple of months ago, uh, one of the members here at uh, Calvary, who likes cars as I do, he invited me and a couple of other men from Calvary to go to the uh, M Performance BMW in South Carolina. BMW have cars, M Performance. Some of you know that. Some of you don't have a clue and are not interested. But I'm going to tell the illustration anyhow. So we went to BMW for M Performance. Now, when I accepted the invitation, I thought, this is good. There's going to be some of these M cars, and we're going to drive around, and uh, we're going to have a great time. But we go in, there's 14 of us, this classroom, there's the instructor, and he says, now if you're just here to dabble around in the cars, go home. And I thought, wow, well, that's me. <laughs> he says, we're going to teach you to drive fast. It was rather more intense than I thought. And so we are with these magnificent, powerful cars going round the track as, he trained, as they try and help us to drive at speed and handle these wonderful machines. And one of the things he told us, and most of us don't do it, as we're driving, look up. He said, so often you'll see a, a pothole in the road, and uh, you although you see it, you still go through it because your car follows your, your line of vision. He says, when you're driving, look up and there are various obstacles that we had to maneuver. And he says, don't just focus on the front, look up. And as I'm driving at speed, there's a walkie-talkie there, and uh, the instructor, who's in a car on the hill, he sees me, and he shouts at me, John, look up, keep looking up. Good advice when you're driving. Good advice when you're following Jesus Christ. What do we do? We look within. We have difficult circumstances, and fear, and worry, and anxiety, and temptation happen when we look down at our circumstances. And that fear and these passions of the flesh distort us and distract us. As followers of Jesus Christ, Peter is saying, listen, you're a sojourner. You're in exile. 
don't go into these fleshly passions. Abstain from them. You're different people. He's told us we have a wonderful inheritance in heaven. It's undefiled. It's imperishable. It's unfading. Remember that. Keep looking up because, end of verse 12, soon there'll be the day of visitation. That's the day of the Lord's return. At any moment, our Lord Jesus Christ will come. He's already referred in chapter 1 to the revelation of Jesus Christ, the apocalypse, the time when our Lord Jesus Christ will come in His glory. This is the day when God is going to intervene in human history. It's coming. Your passions belong to this world. Don't indulge them. Don't look down. Look up. Look up to Christ. Your passions are fleeting. Listen to the Apostle John as he writes about these passions, these desires. First John 2, verse 16, he talks about the desires of the flesh. It's the same word, epithumia. It is the passions of the flesh and the desires, the passions of the eyes and pride of life is not from the Father. God never, ever tempts you with these things. It's from the world, and the world is passing away along with its desires, along with its passions, along with its lusts. But whoever does the will of God abides forever. You're a sojourner. You're an alien. Therefore, abstain from the passions of the flesh. Our Savior is returning. Now, Peter, as he explains and he urges us to abstain from the passions of the flesh, he's not advocating that we live in an isolated spiritual cocoon, wrapped off in cotton wool, as it were, separated from the world. No. Having dealt with the negative command, abstain from the fleshly lusts, which made war against your soul, he now gives a positive command regarding how we are to relate to the external world. <clears throat> but I've got to deal with my internal enemy first, and now I am to shine for Christ in this alien world. Look again at verse 12, 1 Peter 2, verse 12. Keep your conduct among the Gentiles honorable, so that when they speak against you as evildoers, they may see your good deeds and glorify God on the day of visitation. What am I to do? I'm to abstain from these fleshly laws. Yes, but I am to display good deeds. I'm to have a good testimony before unbelievers, the Gentiles, the pagans. We are to display good deeds. This word good is a word used for beauty, word used for being winsome. The believer, you and I, we are to display to the unbelieving world good deeds, not ugly conduct to unbelievers. You say, well, I thought we weren't saved uh, by good deeds. That's right. You're not saved by your good deeds, but we are saved for good deeds. Yes, we're saved, Subud reminded us, entirely of God's grace. It's all of God's grace. I come with all of my sin to the cross, and I look up to Christ who paid the price for my sin. I receive Him as my Savior, and now I am saved. It's entirely of the grace of God. But now that I am following Christ, I'm to display these good deeds. Good works are not the condition of my salvation, but they are the consequence of my salvation. And where there is true, I'm emphasizing true, where there is authentic saving faith, good deeds follow. Acts of kindness, consideration, honesty, helpfulness, purity, generosity, compassion, and love. We are to conduct ourselves <clears throat> well towards the unbelieving world. The unbelieving world sees some Christians as jud judgmental, as harsh, even hateful people. We're not to be harsh or hateful. We are to shine Christ's love. We are to be good. 
excellent, honorable in our behavior. I had the privilege of officiating on Monday at the funeral of Ernie Creech, one of our members. And Sam Jacks, who many of you know, gave a, a eulogy about Ernie. And I was struck as I sat there at the front listening to Sam Jacks. He described Ernie Creech as a good man. I thought that. I'd love if someone could say that truthfully at my funeral, that John Monroe was a good man. What a wonderful description. That's what Peter is saying. You are to be a good man, a person of character, a person of integrity, a person of honor, a person who's genuine, a person who's good, who reaches out to people with goodness, and they see our good needs. deeds. What about you? What would someone say at your funeral? What about your relationship with your neighbors? What about people at work? Oh, they know you're a Christian, but would they say you're characterized by good deeds? Are you a good person doing good deeds? Are you someone who's going around either isolated from people or telling people they're wrong? Now, we are to expect criticism from unbelievers. Peter says that when they speak against you as evildoers. Yes, even when we're doing good deeds, people speak against us. That may be true in your family. You're trying to live for Christ in your family, and you're still being criticized. Certainly, the first century Christians were persecuted. They were slandered. So, we shouldn't be surprised when unbelievers in our family circle, perhaps at work, in society, criticize us and slander us. After all, they hated Christ without a cause, we read. However, in spite of that, they have to recognize that we are characterized by good deeds, and says Peter, they will glorify God when they see our good deeds on the, day of on the days of visitation. Isn't that wonderful? Look at verse 15. For this is the will of God, that by doing good you would put to silence the ignorance of foolish people. Be good. Verse 22. For what credit is it when, when you sin and are beaten for it and endure? But if when you do good and suffer for it, you endure. Our Savior went about doing good. Perfect goodness. Of course we come short. But still, as you live and as you interact with people, portray Christ. Be a good person. Our actions speak much louder than our, our words. Display grace. Display, display beauty. Display goodness and compassion. Shine for Christ. Our impact on the unbelieving world is by holy living and good living, not by strident protests, not by ugly, judgmental words on social media. Isn't it sad? that professing Christians go on social media, and their language and their attitude to people with whom they disagree is ugly, harsh. That's not good. You may disagree, and you may be right to disagree, but your tone, how you communicate, is not to be like the unbelieving. We're to be different. We're beloved of God. We're sojourners and exiles. And we are to display good deeds so that even when people disagree with us, they can glorify God on the day of visitation. That's what Peter is saying. Shine Christ's light, and God will be glorified. Convicted today? Yes. What is Peter saying? How are we going to win this war raging against us? Abstain. Brother? You're involved in the passions of the flesh. You know it's wrong. Will you today before God ask for His help and for a fresh filling of the Spirit to abstain? Live a life not of the passions of the flesh, not of lust. Live a life of love, a life of holiness, a life of goodness, a life of purity. Such a life in this sleazy world 
will mark you as different and will be a powerful witness to unbelievers. We're called to be different. Salt, says Jesus, permeating the corruption. You're the light of the world, illuminating the darkness. And as you live a holy life, and as you live a life characterized by good deeds, a wonderful thing will happen. In spite of the criticisms against you, some will glorify God and say, I see in this woman something of the beauty of our Lord Jesus Christ. What am I saying to you today? Abstain from the passions of the flesh and shine Christ's light. Abstain from the passions of the flesh and shine Christ's light. Let's pray. Father, this is very convicting on both counts. Help us. We need Your help. <clears throat> Realize these passions of the flesh are very alluring. They come as friends, make us feel good, and yet they're our enemy. May many today, students, men and women, be doing business before You now and asking for Your help to abstain. And may we here at Calvary be known not as people who are harsh, who are judgmental, who are even hateful. Help us to be people who display Christ, people of grace, people of elegance, people who are winsome in this corrupt society. And for all of this, Father, we know we have to put on the armor of God against the devil, against the world, against our own flesh. Help us, we ask, in Christ's name. Amen.